All right, thank you. Um, in fact, the Aqua Triana project has tried a couple of times to get a, a Graham Foundation grant and so far without success. So maybe, maybe the third time is the charm. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Uh, please forgive me if this is a little bit rough around the edges. It's been a while since I've given a talk like this. But at least I'm familiar with Zoom, <laughs> all too familiar. You are all familiar, I'm sure, with the, uh, the basic form of, of the Roman aqueduct, uh, at least in, in one uh, of its multiple manifestations, and that is this sort of running arcade um, across the countryside. Uh, that is uh, very much the minority view of Roman aqueducts, to tell you the truth, because uh, for the most part, they ran underground. And of course, their sources almost exclusively were either uh, underground or at the very surface. Obviously, the sources had to surface in order to, uh, to reach the aqueducts. But um, many of them, in fact, were springs, as uh, should be no surprise to you. You're looking here, as many of you know, I'm sure, at the suburbs of the city of Rome itself. And I'm going to be focusing on one aqueduct in particular of that city. Not this one. This is the famous Aqua Claudia to the city's east. Uh, but I simply show it to you as um, a, a kind of um, visual manifestation of what the aqueducts looked like as they approached the city, as they sort of emerged from the hills and then tried to maintain as much height as possible as they approached the city itself. Then, of course, they distributed water all about the city. Um, first, uh, by way of fountains uh, at street sides. And um, you've all seen these, I'm sure, uh, at Pompeii and perhaps Herculaneum too. Uh, small street side basins that are fed by a pressurized water system. Of course, uh, perhaps more famously, the aqueducts were also used for um, supplying water to the, the Roman baths of all sizes, from the grandest, like like this one, um, the baths of Diocletian here on the left, uh, to small household baths. And then of course, uh, grand multi-story fountains as well, um, of which Rome probably had many. Um, you see the remains of one of them down here at the bottom, which doubles also as the main distribution tank of one of the Eastern aqueducts um, at the edge of the city. And I start with the e Eastern aqueducts including the Aqua Claudia, um, uh, marked AC on this, uh, on this map. Uh, you can see that many of the ancient city's aqueducts originated more or less in the same area, up around uh, Tivoli or beyond Tivoli. Many of them came through Tivoli on their way to uh, the city. Others originated in the foothills of the Apennine Mountains, uh, a little bit closer to the city. Uh, including the Aqua Virgo, the Aqua Vergine, which still runs to the city today and, and feeds the, um, uh, the Trevi Fountain. But I'm going to be talking about uh, a rare <laughs> event uh, um, in, in terms of the ancient city of Rome, uh, uh, at least, and that, has, uh, that is an aqueduct coming from the west. As it happens, the region to, uh, to the north and west of, of Rome is a volcanic region. And uh, the volcanoes do in fact continue down to the south and east all the way down to the Bay of Naples and beyond. But uh, this region does not have limestone for the most part. It has very little at least. And, and it's usually limestone karst where you get the best aqueduct sources. But uh, as it happens, there are excellent sources up around this crater lake. Uh, Lago di Bracciano, as it's called. And these are the sources we're going to be focusing on today, the sources of the Aqua Triana, that is the aqueduct of the Emperor Trajan, who, who reigned uh, from the year 98 to 117 uh, CE. All right, so uh, let me go back for a minute, get your bearings. Here's the city of Rome. All right. Uh, here's the course of the aqueduct. And uh, just a few lines give you a sense of uh, where the sources were coming from. This is not complete by any means. And here we have the city of Rome itself and uh, marked out on it, uh, on the map, 
a couple of the major features that this particular aqueduct was built for. First of all, the largest of uh, any existing uh, bath building at its, uh, in, in its time, and that was the, uh, the Baths of Trajan, <clears throat> inaugurated almost exactly the same time as the, uh, as the aqueduct itself. And then off in the Vatican, a, a more specialized structure, the Naumachia, which was intended for <coughs> uh, naval displays um, and, and uh, mock naval battles. We know, however, that the aqueduct also fed fountains and it was distributed throughout the city. We know this because there uh, is an inscription that tells us that. <clears throat> Another thing that we know is that the aqueduct was uh, essentially refurbished. Many of its uh, ancient sources were recaptured and then connected to an early modern aqueduct, the uh, Aqua Paula, as it's called, named after uh, Pope Paul V. The, um, the Pope of the early 17th century who, um, uh, who, who commissioned the project and who ultimately oversaw the construction of this monumental fountain on the Janiculum Hill on the west side of the city of Rome, uh, precisely where the ancient aqueduct, or almost precisely where the ancient aqueduct uh, arrived at the city. So the waters that uh, pour from this fountain are to a large extent, not entirely, but to a large extent, uh, those that uh, also um, contributed to the Aqua Triana itself. As some of you may know, that aqueduct runs directly under the American Academy in Rome, which is also up on the Janiculum Hill. It's really just a stone's throw from the fountain I just showed you. Here's the McKim Mead and White uh, building. Uh, right here, okay, the great villa building, the thing runs uh, diagonally right under it. And it was discovered during excavations for the basements uh, for the cryptoportico level of that, uh, of that structure and preserved so you can get down inside it today, as I did uh, quite some time ago when this picture was taken. I would add that uh, later on, after the reign of Trajan, um, a certain number of grain mills were added to the system. So aqueduct powered uh, grain mills uh, became a part of this conduit. And there are the remains of, of one um, just outside the, the academy building proper, partly under the street, partly under the parking lot. Um, we know that there were many, many more grain mills uh, associated with uh, the Aqua Triana, but we don't yet know exactly where they were. All right, here's our protagonist, of course, the Emperor Trajan himself, uh, who not only commissioned the aqueduct, but uh, also uh, issued coins that celebrated it. And by the way, it's only by means of these coins that anybody knew about the existence of the Aqua Triana um, before the 17th century. And in fact, the Pope himself did not know that the aqueduct he was uh, commandeering, re, uh, that he was recommissioning was the Aqua Triana. He thought it was the only other aqueduct that originated in the West, uh, the Aqua Alciatina. But um, only later on in the 17th century was this issue clarified and was this name attached to the aqueduct I'm going to tell you about. All right, there it is again. And here are some more of the principles. These are uh, the, the key members of, of our team, the Aqua Triana team uh, since the beginning. Uh, I don't include everyone who's been involved in the last five years or so uh, at the moment, but I will um, mention them by name as, as we progress. But um, the, uh, the origins of this project didn't start with me. They started with Ted and Mike O'Neill. Hi, Ted. Uh, good to hear from you. Uh, Ted, Ted's actually joined us for this, uh, for this talk from London where it's after midnight. Uh, <clears throat> father and son team who um, by, uh, by various means, by hook or by crook, rediscovered the most important source of the aqueduct, which I'll be showing you momentarily. Uh, and they did so um, by various means of sleuthing, 
in, uh, including a lot of archive work. So I'm gonna show you some archival documents along the way. And then Catherine Rennie, with whom I also collaborated on the Rome book that Nick showed you just a, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, Catherine, as some of you may know, is an expert on the Aqua Paula and other early modern water systems of the city of Rome. All right, so here's another view of the terminus, as it were. It's not the actual terminus, but it's, uh, it's, it's what we would call the terminal fountain in the city of the Aqua, Aqua Paola. The Italians call it the Fontanone. And some visible uh, architectural features of the existing aqueduct, again, of the Aqua Paola. All right, up near the sources. So this bit of the Aqua Paola, and we'll actually return to this building in a few minutes, is just north of the lake, right up about here. Uh, so it's, it's a bit of the, the main conduit that skirts the lake just to the north. We'll come back to that later on. Certainly one of the most important archival documents that uh, we have used um, comes from the, uh, the state archives in, in Rome. It's a map of the Aqua Paola system we haven't dated it precisely, but we think it's from the late 18th to early 19th century, uh, perhaps 1789, for which we have, we have a reason for that date, but we don't know for sure. And this marks out all of the sources on the system, um, but it's the Aqua Paola system. It's not the sources of the Aqua Triana. So um, when, uh, when Ted and Mike first uh, uh, discovered this map in the, in the archives, they um, decided that they would uh, try to uh, test out some of the information on it to, to, uh, to, to ground truth it, as we would call it today, right? Ground truth it, to get on the ground and see if we could find, if, if they could find some of these sources. And some of them, by the way, are named, all right? So, uh, pardon me. As you can see, there's a long key that gives names of some of the, uh, of the principal sources, all of them numbered. But those are by no means, that's not by no means the only source uh, we, we have that has, has provided really, really critical information for this project. And again, I can thank Ted and, and Mike for, um, for, for coming up with a number of these dark documents in various archives, some of them in London, in fact. This one, for example, is in the British Library. Uh, the, uh, this one is in UCLA, go figure. And uh, these, uh, this one as well. Um, and uh, these two are in Rome. All right, this is one of the, the, uh, the beautiful bird's eye views uh, that um, Ted found, Ted and Mike, at the, uh, the British Library. It was made uh, along with the color version, which you see up here in a smaller scale, we'll come back to that, by, um, by an, uh, uh, an aqueduct engineer named um, Carlo Fontana, um, great name. Um, most appropriate, at a time when he was being commissioned by the landowners in this area to uh, uh, investigate the feasibility of refurbishing ancient ruins of an aqueduct. And at this point, 1692, it was uh, late enough in the century that, uh, that um, Fontana at least, and um, many others as well, knew now that they were probably dealing with the ruins of the Aqua Triana itself. They certainly knew that they were ancient. So Fontana did a survey of the region and um, then he made a number of maps and, um, and, and bird's eye views. And it was this bird's eye view that uh, <clears throat> led Ted to suppose that um, we were dealing with an important ancient source which I will tell you more about right up about here on the bird's eye view, just uh, and probably unknown to Fontana himself, as well as the conduit that led down to the main conduit of the, uh, the, the now existing Aqua Paola, all right? But this is a ruined conduit. So it was not actually providing any water to uh, the refurbished main conduit of the Aqua Paola. So, uh, so, so Ted, um, more or less by guesswork, um, uh, imagined the conduit running along these contours down to the, uh, the existing conduit. And as it turns out, back in 2017, 
some speleologists ground truthed the whole, uh, almost the whole conduit and did in fact find it. And it uh, is absolutely remarkable just how close their findings are. And you see it on the map here on top uh, to uh, Ted and Mike's original uh, hypothesis about the course of this conduit. So we're dealing, as you can see, with two main branches that essentially merge. This red bit is both ancient and modern, okay? It's the ancient conduit, but it's been, uh, of course, reconditioned and has water running in it today. And then there's this ancient conduit, which was much more mysterious. But by various means, um, our, <clears throat> our heroes knew that um, the uh, origins of this conduit were up near a church um, named Santa Fiora, a church that no longer exists but appears on many, many maps. And uh, Fontana knew this as well. He knew that there was a, uh, uh, well, there was a church there at the time and he drew it on his maps. Uh, Fontana was also able at some point, we don't know where along the conduit before it broke, uh, be before it reached its ruined uh, point downhill, he was able to measure its, uh, its volume, the, the volume of the water. And it turned out that this was the single most voluminous source uh, in the entire region. And it had been, in fact, um, been used in uh, the prior century uh, for powering uh, mills and things of that sort. So, so it was not going to waste, but it was, uh, it was being channeled down a creek that led toward the lake in a different direction. Now, here's Fontana's color uh, bird's eye view. Uh, here's the church off in the distance. Okay, you can see it up here, I think. I, I believe that's the church. I, um, I can't see it because my view is blocked. Uh, but then these interesting hydraulic features, all of which have disappeared today, except maybe for this kind of waterfall, uh, which turns out um, we did some ground truthing and found uh, that, that in fact there is a Trajanic or at least a uh, a late first century, early second century bridge, essentially here. It's, it's more like a culvert, okay? And the aqueduct ran on top of that. It's still there, but it's in dense forest. And we do deal with a lot of dense forest um, in, in this area, as you can see uh, from the, uh, the Google satellite view here. Okay, so here's another view. Now I've reversed the colors. So uh, yellow, is the, in a sense, the longer conduit, okay? And uh, red is the shorter conduit, at least um, in terms of their length before they join um, at, uh, at the main conduit here. But you'll note there are other branches that lead into the main conduit as well. And I'm gonna to talk to you uh, about those two a little later on. Here perhaps is the most extraordinary document that Ted and Mike dug up and they got it from the Lanciani archives in Rome um, at the uh, Biazza. Uh, that's the, um, uh, well, uh, suffice it to say that it's a, an archive uh, of the history of art uh, that, that's in the, um, the Piazza Venezia uh, in downtown Rome. There are many, many maps from the early modern period associated with the, this region and the reason for that is quite simple. There were a lot of land disputes, border disputes. A lot of the region, uh, a lot of the area was owned in some fashion by the Catholic Church, maybe by various organizations of the Catholic Church. So they were still thought to, uh, to be in a sense, uh, different properties. But, but, there's, uh, but there was also uh, a great deal of land that was owned simply by large, uh, by, by um, powerful uh, Italian families. Uh, including the um, Orsini family. And then a lot of that property was bought up later on by the Odescalchi family who, who still own uh, much of the land in this region, but not as it turns out, Santa Fiora itself. Santa Fiora is just off the Odescalchi family on a very small uh, farm plot um, owned by um, a, uh, a farmer who allowed Ted and Mike onto his property when they realized that the, uh, the location of this now lost church was probably uh, directly on their property. But if you look at this map, uh, 
you can see that it's, um, uh, it, it illustrates not only the church, but also other interesting features. At one time, uh, it had a, a little formal garden out in front, olive grove, uh, a monument out in front with a symbol on it that, um, that, that demonstrates that, um, that, that this, this plot of land belonged to the Hospital of the Holy Spirit, the uh, Ospedale uh, del Santo, uh, Santo Spirito in, in Rome. Um, and some other interesting features, including this G, which is still there today, and um, a well, okay? In fact, this very handy key says, says um, a well with running water. How weird is that? <laughs> Uh, well, it's precisely what you would expect to find, perhaps, if you knew a lot about Fontana's work in this region. So what, in fact, is being uh, shown here is um, the wellhead. You can see that. And then a tree next to it that's supporting a shaduf, which is a, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a very uh, ancient water lifting device, uh, which was clearly being used even in this period in the 18th century um, on this little farm, which evidently belonged to the church. Um, and that shaduf had a bucket on it, which of course could be dipped down into this, um, in, in, into this well of running water um, to, uh, to, uh, to, to retrieve the water itself. And uh, this is more or less uh, how we reconstruct it on the basis of uh, our subsequent discoveries. This little hut, by the way, um, opens onto a stairway that takes you down into an aqueduct. Okay, so the, uh, the plot thickens, as does the underbrush, at least as it did a decade ago, um, a little more than a decade ago when we first investigated this. Uh, the, the reason that Santa Fiora was kind of unknown to scholarship was that it was in dense forest. But of course, the landowner knew all about it. Um, as landowners do, but they don't tell you these things, right? And they certainly don't tell uh, nosy archeologists. They don't necessarily tell the water authority, although in this case, uh, the father of the current uh, farmer was the water authority. He actually operated um, a system that was still functioning as late as, the, uh, as 1984, when uh, the nearby town drilled new uh, wells and, and uh, very quickly lowered the water table essentially rendering this source useless. But the source itself is deep inside this, this thicket. Um, and it is in fact a grotto. Uh, and it's a grotto that as far as we can tell is Roman all the way to the top. And the way we know that is that it still has uh, some Roman frescoes on the underside of, the, uh, of this nice cross vault in, um, <clears throat> in a particular pigment called uh, Egyptian blue. Uh, which uh, this particular uh, woman, uh, who is a scholar of, uh, of uh, wall painting and, uh, and frescoes, um, she lab tested it. So there's no doubt about it. It's Egyptian blue and it's, uh, therefore it's ancient. All right, so what do we have here? What we have is uh, a grotto that's um, sunk into a hillside upon on top of which at one uh, for, for many centuries until the late 19th century there existed a church but the church was decommissioned in the 1890s and uh, dismantled and the area was allowed to just um, to, to, uh, to, to uh, be lost in, in the undergrowth as it were but inside you have a rather chapel-like space a raised floor and we know that it's raised because there's a head of uh, Let's see, yeah, the head of a statue niche here. And then a much later, um, probably 16th century frame here, where originally there was a, uh, a portrait of the Virgin. And it was after the Virgin, the Virgin of the Flower, that the church above was named. So, okay, so it was La Madonna de la Fiora. Um, so the Madonna of the Flower. Her portrait was thought to work miracles. Uh, which is why this church had uh, considerable importance, even though it was tiny, over the course of several centuries, probably as far back as the 13th century. And then a statue niche below, 
which appears to, although it's been uh, reshaped a little bit, appears to be ancient because uh, we could still see radial Roman bricks. And then uh, large arches on either side, which also are Roman, good two foot Roman bricks, classic bipedalis as they're called. And once you go through this little doorway here over on the right, I'm sorry, you, um, and you have to have a ladder to do it, you get down into a spring house. And the spring house, again, is fully Roman. All of the brickwork pretty much is Roman. Um, you can see that it's abandoned. There are roots of the fig trees uh, extending down through this cute little oculus. How Roman is that? At the top of this, um, this, this rather interesting vault, it's a, it's a cross vault, but not exactly rectangular. Um, and then, although you can't quite see it, there's an intake over here behind this man and um, additional uh, gaps for the introduction of water down in the lower uh, sectors of the wall. And then an offtake, and you see Mike in the offtake over here. I'm sorry, the intake is behind Mike. You can see it, right? Good Roman brick. And the offtake is right here. So um, full size of a typical Roman aqueduct. You go downhill for uh, a few meters and you look up and you see what is probably the mother shaft of the system, which undoubtedly is the well of running water. So the water was indeed running under the well. It was not a standard uh, uh, well simply tapping into an aquifer, uh, but instead it was a well uh, that, that was being supplied by an aqueduct, which still had some water running through it uh, in the 18th century, as it did all the way up to 1984. And then of course, the aqueduct continues downhill. Sorry, that's my landline. And look at this, um, a few more meters down the conduit and um, it's, it's brickwork up to a certain point and then it converts to classic Roman opus reticulatum right here. And then beyond the reticulatum, you get to a point where a very neatly applied uh, layer of hydraulic cement uh, can be seen. And that extends below the water, excuse me, uh, all the way across and up the other side. You can see that this um, hydraulic cement has a kind of sheen to it. Uh, it can be polished to almost a mirror finish. And this is a formula that, that is, seems to be almost exactly like the Roman formula uh, called opus signinum. And we're not entirely sure whether it's ancient or early modern, but uh, we are now convinced that um, by the 17th century, uh, the Pope's engineers had, uh, had managed to, uh, to replicate the ancient formula for Opus Signinum and were using it to line the Aqua Paula. So this may very well be 17th century, but, um, and, and it's in such great shape that, uh, that we think perhaps it is. So here you get a schematic view uh, of where the conduit goes, where it's broken along the way, bits of opus reticulatum and, and brickwork and, and stonework and so on. And then here, uh, whatever this thing is, uh, perhaps a settling tank, all right? And then the continuation of the conduit uh, beyond, but with many breaks. So of course, once you got past this point, uh, you, uh, you were dealing with a system that probably had virtually no water in it whatsoever. The water instead was uh, being dumped out into a creek, which runs down in this direction and heads uh, directly for the lake. And that water, by the way, was still uh, feeding mills in the 17th century and perhaps even the 18th century. So the water by hook or by crook was being uh, essentially um, commandeered uh, for mills that straddled this creek down by the lake. And here's the creek on uh, another map. This one comes from the Orsini archives at UCLA. Here's the church, okay, Santa Fiora, with its source, probably this little bump right here. Uh, the mills down here, all right, H and I. So clearly the creek is just being augmented by the source. There is no aqueduct really 
uh, in operation at this, um, in, at this stage. Instead, the water is just being diverted into the creek and the creek is, is serving to, uh, to power the mills. But on this particular map, uh, drawn for the Orsini family, uh, again, conveniently with, uh, with, key, uh, with a key, uh, feature Q is designated a conduit which captured the lost waters called Carestia and brought them to the Fiora. So uh, from that, uh, we determined that there must have been a second source that brought water in this direction and then merged it with the Fiora here. But also quite clearly, it was, uh, it was dry uh, by the time that this map was made. So it was no use to the, uh, to the Orsini, and it was certainly no use later on to the Odiscalchi. But uh, Ted and Mike wanted to see what, if they could find any evidence of this. And um, but, uh, at this point, once you cross the creek, you're on Odiscalchi uh, property. And so Ted, who is very good at buttering up the aristocracy, uh, did just that and, and got, some, uh, uh, got some good information from the game warden who knew something about some ancient ruins on the property. And there happens to be, even today, a gravel road which goes off in this direction. Here's Santa Fiora. There is a gravel road today that's still, um, uh, that, that's still used, uh, at least up to this, uh, uh, to this uh, oh, here's the gravel road right here, all right. And then there is a gravel road that heads on into Odiscalchi property. Um, in this direction. So they followed that road and off to one side. Um, this is what they were shown. And uh, they very kindly showed it to me the, um, very shortly thereafter and to Catherine Rennie, who is shown here for scale. So what do we have? Once again, we have um, a vaulted space which is clearly designed to be something more than just functional, right? Because it has a statue niche. And above, once again, a light shaft in the form of an oculus. And here you can see sort of um, in profile, those uh, two foot Roman bricks, which lined the bottom of the light shaft. In both cases, you have to uh, be aware, right? They're partially buried. So you're just looking at the, uh, at the top part of the, of the statue niche. Couple more views of the oculus. All right, so now let's get our bearings again. Okay, the Santa Fiora was the first and most important source to be discovered. But this one is even more mysterious. The Santa Fiora at least had a name and it was on every map. It, it's on virtually every map up to the 20th century. Um, and, and it's still, I mean, it's, it's still being put on maps today. It's just that after the 19th century, the, the church itself was lost to memory. And um, uh, interestingly, none of these aqueduct features was ever discovered uh, by any of the great aqueduct hunters of Rome, including Thomas Ashby and Esther Van Diemen, certainly not um, Rodolfo Lanciani. Um, these are all features that uh, remained unknown to archaeology until the 2000s. And then we have this other major source. We have no idea how much water it provided in antiquity, but clearly it had gone dry by the early modern period, and it's been dry ever since. Uh, today it's, a, it's basically where uh, porcupines hang out, uh, down in this little hole here. All right, so let's go back to the British Library and to a map that was a, a, another very useful map drawn by Fontana, which gives us so many topographical names. Uh, many of these names are not uh, in use today, and so, so we uh, often don't know exactly what they refer to, but many of them refer to water features that are also lost. Things like the uh, Bagni di Venere, the, the Baths of Venus. Um, nobody has any idea what those are or where, they, or, well, I mean, we know more or less where they were because they're on the map, but we, they haven't been pinpointed. There is so much yet to be found uh, along the sources of this, uh, of this aqueduct. So in addition to uh, tracking down these sources, uh, we have also been very serious about investigating the conduits that lead from the sources as well. 
And go figure, but a lot of the southernmost uh, part of the conduit, uh, the part beyond Santa Fiora, further to the south, was also refurbished for the Aqua Paula, but has already fallen out of use. Um, at most, it might have functioned for about a century um, from the 1610s onward, uh, and, and then fallen out of use, probably because the sources weren't providing enough uh, water to, uh, to be worth maintaining. And so the result is that you get picturesque ruins like this. Here's a bridge with an actual inscription saying Aqua Paula on it, uh, crossing one of the many creeks that, uh, that run down into, uh, into the lake. Or bits and pieces of the conduit as it runs along the contours of the hillsides. And as you can imagine, these would not be visible uh, from any distance, right? You essentially just have to happen upon them or uh, of course, um, typically what we do is, is we use educated, I mean, we make educated guesses. We, we follow things uh, by contours. We know more or less where we are in terms of uh, elevation and so on. And um, aqueducts can't defy the laws of physics. So they have to stay at more or less the same level as they run. There are, there are ways to find these things. And as you might expect, most of these features are known at least to a few people in the area. And so this kind of documentation included um, photographing, uh, measuring, um, and, and publishing uh, features that we found along the way. Very few of which I would add, we simply stumbled upon. Most of this came to us by word of mouth, by people who knew somebody who knew somebody who, you know, who had a farm uh, and, and could lead us to bits and pieces of the, uh, of the aqueduct. And there's just no doubt about it. Here we're looking at good Roman work, okay? Triangular bricks um, and uh, two foot bricks down here uh, projecting out and nice opus reticulatum above. So in a very trajanic fashion, you have a good combination of brick and reticulate in many parts of, uh, of this system. Here's some opus reticulatum that has been covered with moss and then um, we just uh, just cleared this off with our hands, basically. We found a bit of the conduit on the inside. This is the um, uh, essentially the top of the uh, opus signinum lining, which rolls around the, uh, the edge like the top of a bathtub. And then the vault, probably from the 17th century, uh, was added on top of that. So once you get beyond this, this nice rolled edge, you're down inside the conduit. All right, the project has, uh, has included, as, as I said, a good bit of surveying, although most of it is not scientific surveying, we just do field reconnaissance uh, uh, when we can. But um, in uh, the, the last uh, few years before the, uh, the pandemic, we, um, we started doing a bit more uh, precise surveying. Um, and we brought some more, thing, more people onto the team, uh, including Ben Gorham here. Um, who, uh, who did some of our photogrammetry and here is uh, operating the total station and, um, and a couple of, um, of uh, UT geoarchaeologists, uh, Tim Beach and Cheryl Lazatter Beach, who um, have, been do have been testing uh, the source waters. And of course, when you work in the woods, you work with woodland creatures. So here's a member of our team as well. Now, I've emphasized the extent to which some of the ancient uh, aqueduct is merged into the modern system. And let's uh, bear in mind that the modern system is, you know, is, is part of the, um, the water system of the city of Rome, right? It's uh, managed and controlled by Acea, the, the water authority. And, um, and, and so sometimes you will enter a source by way of a modern manhole and go down a, a modern iron stair and get down to a level that is considerably more ancient, although in this case, probably not antiquity, most likely 17th century. And yet it is almost certainly on the footprint of a spring source of the Aqua Triana. And we say that because uh, in this case, you see these, um, the, uh, these little holes here, these little house shaped holes are all intakes, but at one end of this spring house is an offtake 
And uh, you can walk down that offtake, um, bent double, uh, more or less. And maybe 50 meters down or so, you get past a few little um, steps along the way, and you encounter Roman brick. These are sesquipedales, one and a half uh, Roman feet in uh, width. And then, uh, stepped up on either side, the two footers again, the bipedales. Uh, it so happened when we first uh, got down inside this source um, and encountered what we thought was probably Roman brick, we also encountered a couple of brick stamps which uh, precisely date this to the Trajanic period. So the floor of the offtake conduit is ancient, even if the walls of the, uh, the spring house itself are much more recent. All right, let's move. Um, we, we've been uh, actually uh, focusing on the southern sources, which are off the map here down below. Uh, and the, uh, of course, the Santa Fiora source, uh, which actually isn't even on this map because it was never a part of the Aqua Paula system. And it's still not a part of the Aqua Paula system today. Remember that it, uh, most of its conduits on the way to the main conduit is broken. Okay. Um, now let's focus on a couple of sources uh, to the north. Specifically, um, not so much the sources in this case, but the conduit leading from the sources down to the, uh, uh, the main conduit of the aqueduct, but also uh, really a much more interesting uh, cluster of features down here. And that's what I'm gonna spend uh, the next few minutes on. Well, let's start on, uh, let's start with the, um, the longer of the two. Uh, along this creek here. There are several of these abandoned bridges in the system, and they are all from the 17th century. In some cases, they may very well enclose an ancient bridge, and um, we are pretty much of that opinion with regard to this bridge in particular. Although the facing that you see is, uh, is mostly modern. Um, there, it may be that these, uh, some of these blocks at least are, are ancient. They are interestingly um, almost exactly a Roman foot high. So that would suggest that this bridge was originally Roman. But things get very confusing very quickly. Okay, here it is, um, about halfway between the sources and the conduit itself, the main conduit. It has a bridge because it has to cross a creek. That's why these bridges exist. But the, um, the conduits themselves tend to parallel the, creek, uh, the creeks, as you might expect, because they, they need to follow the contours um, as best they can on their way down to the conduit. Uh, so, but periodically, they do have to cross the creek. Obviously, because the main conduit is flowing to the right, they're going to have to cross the creek at some point. Um, they could go all the way down to the main conduit, but the main conduit so itself then has to cross. So here's the crossing. The, uh, the problem is uh, there isn't just one. Oh, <laughs> I forgot about this. Yeah, the last time we were there, we just happened to turn this up when we were um, poking around in the woods. Uh, this is almost certainly one of the inscriptions that went on this, in, on this bridge, probably this patch right here. This is a later patch in the masonry. So somebody just took it off and um, threw it in the woods and we found it. Here's the weird thing though, uh, the ruins of an ancient bridge right next to it. Here it is again, another view. You can see how precarious it is today, but it's definitely ancient, it's Roman. Roman brick and then reticulate above that. And not only that, but a fallen chunk of ancient aqueduct conduit right next to it, right across from it. So clearly this was part of the bridge. This was an aqueduct bridge, of course, but it was separate from the bridge that you see here. And that would seem to suggest that um, this entire bridge in the foreground must be post-antique uh, since it's clearly replacing the old one, but um, we're, we're not at all sure about that um, for various reasons that are probably too complicated to go into 
here, but uh, here's schematically what the system looks like, okay? All right, so the ancient conduit came down and then crossed at um, a diagonal and then continued down on the other side. And we know that because this sector of the bridge is on the diagonal, okay? Whereas the existing bridge, which is still, of course, derelict, it's not being used, it's obviously overgrown, um, much, much later perhaps, or maybe not, uh, crosses at a 90 degree angle. And then of course, uh, joins up with the old conduit. Here's a bit of the ancient conduit, good uh, Roman concrete here in section. This is the bottom of the conduit itself. That's what was being carried on this um, diagonal bridge, um, which is weird for a number of reasons. It had piers that stood in the, uh, in the creek. You really don't need that on a tiny creek like this. You really ought to just be able to arch it with a single arch as is the case with this bridge. Um, and um, it, it uh, clearly didn't, didn't hold up over time. And so we've, uh, we've come to the conclusion that, um, and, and we're not 100% sure of this, but we were sure enough about it to publish it in our most recent article in the American Journal of Archaeology, as a matter of fact, that came out um, this past October. And it's, um, uh, it's open source, by the way, so or I should say um, open access, so you can, um, you can find it easily online. Well, we've decided that um, probably these two bridges represent two different phases in the ancient aqueduct, and that the earlier bridge may very well have belonged uh, to a system that was initiated not by Trajan, but by his recent predecessor, Domitian. And the reason we want to associate Domitian with this area is that he owned a lot of property down here, um, very, very close by. So I'm going to uh, spend the next few minutes focusing on that property. And um, I apologize, I'm going to run past eight uh, by some considerable distance, but um, I promise you I won't take you past 815. Domitian, as it happens, um, owned a villa down here, I'll show it to you in a minute, and also seems to have controlled um, a very important thermal spring source here. This is a complicated region in terms of hydrogeology. So not only do you have pure cold water uh, originating from springs in the area, but you also have hot springs. And hot springs, as you know, I'm sure, are uh, very popular not just today in Europe, but, um, but were very popular in antiquity as well. So it turns out this was, um, this was a kind of pilgrimage center in antiquity. It was uh, not just a spa, but also a sanctuary. And by the way, uh, it was a spa in the modern period too, uh, up until fairly recently. Uh, this U-shaped building is the building that you see on the plan in pink right here in the, in the red circle. This is what it looks like today, so it's obviously abandoned. Okay, uh, back to Domitian and his grand villa which in fact is that building I told you about earlier, right up here on a promontory overlooking the lake. Now this is a 16th century building uh, built on top of the foundations of the villa, but there is plenty of Domitianic brickwork that has allowed archeologists to date the original villa to this emperor. That's not the only thing that um, associates this area with Domitian either. Uh, so I'll come back to uh, that in just a minute. But let's, um, uh, let's look at this spa uh, a little bit more closely. Here's a plan of it. Here's the uh, modern hotel. This was built in the uh, 1850s. Okay, right here. Uh, uh, meant to be a resort hotel, which is what it was until the mid 20th century. Bits and pieces of uh, a larger complex attached to uh, the hot springs themselves. The hot springs are actually embedded inside the hotel today. But when they were excavated for the construction of the hotel back in the 1850s, an enormous votive deposit was recovered directly from the hot spring itself. And I'll show you some of the objects that, were, uh, that belonged to that deposit in just a minute. Then Domitian built a new bath just off to the east. Uh, a conventional bath complex, 
In other words, it wasn't, it, uh, it probably wasn't uh, supplied, or at least not principally supplied by the hot springs, which in fact just flow into the creek um, right down, uh, down here and off to the lake. So this bath was being supplied by another water source. And next to it, a monumental nymphaeum, that is a, um, a display fountain with a statue uh, niche right here. Here's a view of the niche, and here's a view of the statue that, uh, that most scholars believe uh, comes from that niche. It's a statue of Apollo. So most likely this entire sanctuary was dedicated to uh, the god Apollo, who is a god of healing, right? And hot springs in the Roman period were always to a greater or lesser extent associated with healing. All right, here's a um, Google Maps uh, view of the site just to get your bearings, right? There's the U-shaped uh, hotel, uh, the baths themselves. Here's the creek uh, running beside the, uh, the baths and uh, the statue was uh, right about there. Okay, the baths themselves right inside the hotel building. Here's what's left. Um, of the, uh, the Nymphaeum, it's, it's quite a bit actually. And we know that this is Domitianic because it's uh, full of bricks that carried uh, Domitianic brick stamps. So this is not from Trajan's period, this is from the time of his predecessor. <clears throat> also, here uh, is just a single cup from two views uh, recovered from that uh, votive deposit with an inscription on it that says to Apollo and the Domitianic nymphs, and then the name of the dedicator. So the nymphs of this, uh, that is the goddesses, right? Um, controlling the waters of this region were called the Domitianic nymphs. So that um, pretty much seals the deal that uh, uh, Domitian uh, controlled uh, the spa in this region. Now, the connection to Apollo is solidified by the existence on this famous uh, medieval map, which is derived indirectly from ancient prototypes okay, of a site called Aquae Apollinaris, okay, so waters of Apollo, which are in fact along this uh, second route paralleling the coast from Rome, which would be off to the right, uh, up toward Etruria, off to the left. Here's another, um, here's another hot um, spring over here, Aquae Tauri, which has been excavated as well. I'll show you uh, some re um, remains of that later on if, if I have time. A few more of the, uh, of the discoveries. Um, our colleague Ben was delighted to learn that, um, that, that one of these uh, objects in the votive deposit is in, <clears throat> is in the Cleveland Museum where he just uh, moved after his first uh, season with us um, back in 2019. That's the, the Cleveland Cup as it's called, comes from this deposit as did a bunch of gold vessels, which have since been stolen from the Vatican Museum, uh, and um, many, many other things, including thousands of coins. Uh, this may be the best single deposit of cast Roman coins uh, known, and uh, the famous Vicarello cups. Uh, we are in fact talking about a site that is named Vicarello uh, today. Um, they're famous because they, um, uh, inscribed on them is a list of, um, of sites along a pilgrimage route leading from Spain to Rome and on and on. Okay, so clearly this was a pilgrimage site. Pilgrimage site on a pretty significant scale. Now up above the baths are two cisterns. So that, uh, that, that simply confirms uh, what should be obvious anyway, and that is that these baths were being supplied by a separate source of water than the hot springs themselves. This is probably an earlier cistern, probably Domitianic, and this is the much larger later cistern. Uh, this thing's 50 meters long. Uh, that's really substantial, and it would require a substantial aqueduct uh, conduit uh, to supply it. Uh, we, we did a, a photogrammetric survey of, uh, of both of them, uh, which we have on Sketchfab today. 
So where were the sources for this? Well, um, one colleague on our team, um, Giovanni Isidori, who happened also to have been uh, the local uh, waterman of the, um, the, uh, the town of Manciana for many years, uh, did some uh, reconnaissance and um, uh, discovered a really extraordinary thing. And that is this feature right up here, which in fact crosses a bridge uh, at this, uh, across this creek and then heads down in this direction and undoubtedly deposited some of its waters into the cistern, uh, both of these cisterns, per perhaps an earlier one, and then its replacement when the system was augmented in the ancient period. And then of course the conduit would have continued on to, to join the, uh, the main conduit. Oh, and <clears throat> this is all on the map, uh, the 1879 map, okay? Uh, so it was by means of this that um, uh, Ted and Mike actually were interested in, um, in uh, investigating this area from very early on, but our initial attempts to find this source uh, were foiled, but um, Giovanni found it on his own uh, later on. And this is what he saw. Uh, required scrambling up a pretty steep uh, um, slope uh, to get to this spot. But once you get up here, there's all kinds of evidence of construction. Um, including a couple of, of wells, basically access wells is what they are. The Italians uh, <clears throat> uh, sometimes refer to these as, as cheap or, or sometimes pozzo um, if they are access wells. And then weirdly, a, a buttress with Roman brick and concrete right up against the cliff, cliff face uphill. So Giovanni brought us to, uh, to this site and we started investigating it in earnest. And um, uh, there is an, uh, a modern means of access into this. Um, there, there are actually two. There, there's a modern entrance, uh, a, a con uh, it's not concrete actually, but it's, um, but it's probably late 19th, early 20th century entrance that's separate from this one. This one probably is from the 17th century. Uh, but speleologists have gotten down inside from time to time. So, so um, a few people, have known about this, uh, th this site in, in some fashion. But again, it's utterly unknown to scholarship. And here's what you encounter once you get down inside. And on the cliff side, um, you have uh, an arcade. The arcade is built right up against the cliff, um, which is coated with uh, lava. And then behind the lava is an aquiferous um, pyroclastic rock. So the lava, as you might imagine, has cracks in it, splits where the water emerges and the water just gushes out from numerous sources and then flows uh, into the main channel. So we mapped it out and, uh, and, and this is what it looks like. We have the main gallery, what we call the zigzag channel over here, and then the offtake that takes, you, uh, takes the water downhill and across the creek. And this ragged line is the cliff face. Another view of it. And look at how close it is to the, you know, to, to the, the bath complex itself. And so on. It's really hard not to um, associate this with a, a Domitianic phase. In other words, um, we are very much of the conviction now that this part of the aqueduct predates Trajan. Some people would even say that perhaps the very earliest parts of the um, baths of Trajan in Rome were also built by Domitian because there are some bricks with Domitianic stamps uh, in, uh, in the, at the lower levels. So it may very well be that Domitian is the person, uh, is the emperor who envisioned a grand aqueduct leading to Rome, but an er even earlier phase uh, during Domitian's uh, rule would suggest that he commandeered this water initially uh, to supply uh, the baths that he built um, right across the creek. And here are just a, a few views in various directions. Here's a sense of how uh, the water actually gushes out uh, of the rock even today. Okay, in this case, directly behind one of the, uh, the piers, suggesting that, um, th that this particular opening um, has issue started issuing water uh, after, 
after the um, initial architecture was built. Okay, we've done photogrammetry um, of, of the entire uh, source uh, architecture. Here you can see Ben uh, taking pictures. And we did photogrammetry of the, um, uh, of the surface as well. These, by the way, are markers of various sources that, uh, that stand directly underground. That's all that they are. They're just markers. These two features, the larger ones, were originally access wells. This one is completely sealed off today, but, um, but this is the one that has the hole in it. And a mysterious Roman brick and concrete feature up above. You can see the Roman concrete very clearly exposed here. Here's a bit of brick over here. Um, it's, it's vaulted. And we didn't really understand it until we did photogrammetry. And then we realized that <clears throat> these vaults above are double width, uh, the arches below, that is in the conduit underground. And here, by the way, is the modern entrance, um, a manhole with a square lid, which was completely obscured. Uh, it took Giovanni more than a day to find it, even though he could see it from inside because there was, of course, a stair leading up to it. Um, and he got inside by means of the older point of access. So this has been abandoned for many decades, perhaps as much as a century. So we've got this rather monumental arch structure above and, and its monumentality is somewhat reminiscent of the modest monumentality of the other two really important sources, the Aqua Triana, uh, the, uh, the Santa Fiora and the Carestia. And it's above ground. And while it's obscured in the woods today, it would have been right up on the hillside directly visible from the baths. So if you were down in the region of the, um, of the hot springs, you would almost certainly uh, be able to see uh, this, this great vaulted arched structure rising up against the cliff face and serving essentially as a buttress against the cliff face uh, for the conduit beneath it. But my emphasis here is on its monumentality. It was meant to be seen. It was meant even to be visited. And it would be easy to visit it. You could just cross at the bridge or you could cross the creek. Um, you could just step across the creek almost and make your way up to this site almost as if, as if you were a pilgrim to it. And that in essence is the point I want to leave you with, okay? I am, I am literally going to take you till quarter after and then we're gonna be done. So let's focus on pilgrimage here again for a minute. Remember, this, this site is called uh, Aquae Apollinaris, okay? Up here at Vicarello. There were three other uh, major pilgrimage sites as well, all of them with hot springs in the region. So near the famous site of Cervetteri, the Aquae Cairetanae, at Stiliano, even closer by, um, uh, another uh, Roman source, which uh, also has yielded a, a votive deposit. And then uh, the famous Trajanic um, springs over here, the Aquae Tauri, which uh, you may recall appeared on the, um, uh, the medieval map as well. So what we're looking at is a whole network, in essence, of, um, of pilgrimage sites of which Vicarello may have been the most important of all, at least initially. Um, perhaps it was overtaken eventually by Aquae Tauri, each one of them easily within a day of the others. So I wanna suggest that the monumentalization of these spring sources actually has something to do with uh, the uh, attachment of Vicarello and these other sites to uh, pilgrimages. So first I wanna suggest hypothetically that there was probably a, a route that um, allowed easy access from the Stiliano, uh, Stiliano Baths um, for pilgrims to Vicarello itself. Uh, following this creek, which crosses at a bridge right here and heading over in this direction and then joining what we know to be um, a, 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 an ancient road and which today is the gravel road I was telling you about before. And it takes you right past Santa Fiora and right past Caristia. And then it sort of peters out today in the forest, but it's heading in the right direction.
to get you to Vicarello and to the, um, uh, the, uh, the thermal baths there. Um, so uh, I leave you simply with the, um, with the likelihood, I think, uh, or let's say possibility that the, uh, the road system even in this area uh, was designed to, to some extent in order to allow pilgrims who moved from one healing site to another easy access uh, from one to the next within a day's travel uh, and culminating perhaps at Vicarello, which I think was probably the most venerable of all of these sources. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Taylor. That was fabulous. And although, as you say, we're a little over time, I think we can have some questions nonetheless. Um, if people have them, we actually have a couple of questions already in the chat. Um, and maybe I could start with those if it's okay. Um, Mark asks, um, what other activities besides milling grain were associated with the aqueducts? That is, this was early on um in your talk he was he was wondering uh when you brought up the mills that had been added to the stream um he wondered whether there were other activities well uh certainly consumption is what um is what the aqueducts are first and foremost about um in terms of industrial use um not a lot okay there were several types of milling that uh, that, that could be done uh, with aqueducts in antiquity there's no doubt about that including um saw milling for example, uh, grain milling, uh, hammer mills probably, and so on. Um, but then in terms of consumption, well, there is of course aesthetic consumption and that's what the, uh, uh, the fountains are about in principle. And then of course there is physical consumption um, either by means of baths uh, or by, by means of, uh, of fountains. Or of course, uh, if you were well off having the water piped directly into your house um, as we know happened to uh, in Pompeii and Herculaneum and probably many other Roman cities as well. So I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> and if people have other questions, maybe rather than typing them into the chat, oh, I see there's lots of new, ma new messages. Um, fantastic. Thank you. Um, Ace Higsley asks, I'm a student. I was wondering what literary resources you would recommend to find out how <clears throat> aqueducts work alongside grain mills. Ah, well, um, yeah, okay, for aqueducts, the, um, the, the Bible is still um, Trevor Hodge, uh, Roman Aqueducts and Water Supply. Uh, I need to tell you no more about that. Um, just go straight to uh, <clears throat> Hodge. Um, for Mills, I, I would recommend a, a book called Millstone and Hammer um, uh, by uh, an author named Michael Lewis. It's, it's hard to get, um, but you can get it through interlibrary services, I hope, or it might even be available through Hockey Trust uh, during these um, pandemic days. Um, the, the, those, are, um, those are the definitive works, I would say, on, on each. And I see that a couple people, Bela and Jerry, have their hands up. So let me put them on. Bela, do you want to go first? Yes, uh, I have a question about uh, maps. What kind of maps and map notations did the builders use in particular to mark distances and elevations? It must have been brutal to work on a hilly terrain. Yeah, uh, yes, it, it was. And, uh, but I would, um, <clears throat> I, I would suggest that probably uh, no maps were being used necessarily in the, uh, the planning of the aqueduct at the planning stage. Uh, were probably produced later on. Uh, they may very well have been schematic. That is, um, they, they probably were not accurate planographically the way that this, uh, that this uh, Google, Google satellite map is, but they were accurate enough, right? Even like, I mean, look at Fontana's maps. Those are not planographically accurate. They are essentially you know, drawn um, more or less to scale, but, um, but, but with, with no additional interest in accuracy. What needs to be accurate is elevation. That's much more important than, um, than, than uh, making uh, uh, an, an accurate plan of, of a site as you're working on it. Now you need to have some sense of distance, 
because elevation is a function of distance. That is a slope, obviously, is a function of elevation and distance. And slope is, is it has to be very carefully controlled when you're um, building and designing an aqueduct. But uh, distance can just be paced out sometimes. If you're in the woods, you can just pace it out. Um, or you can use various triang triangulation tricks. Uh, it's all ultimately um, a, a little bit um, it, uh, provisional. There, there's, there's no need to be pre uh, absolutely precise, uh, again, with, with planographic uh, features. Um, but maps were definitely made uh, later on, probably for, uh, for legal purposes. Uh, again, they, they most likely were schematic if, they, if you could get away with that. Uh, occasionally, um, something more accurate perhaps needed to be made. But you will notice, for example, that most of those um, 16th, 17th, and 18th century property maps that I showed you, again, were not particularly accurate from the standpoint of, uh, of um, cartography. They were um, drawn by eye, basically. That was thought to be good enough. And then often you will see uh, measurements written in numbers along the, um, the edges of the properties. Uh, and um, so, so again, I would emphasize the Romans uh, were capable of producing very good maps, but they did them as rarely as possible. Jerry, you had your hand up. Yeah, so, so first of all, I just want to say you and your colleagues work is remarkable. I enjoyed the lecture very, very much. And then my question is about, uh, is there any literary sources that you has been used to track down the, the aqueducts other than the maps? Because I saw most of your sources are uh, old maps. Mm -hmm. So is there any like written records about the aqueducts? Yeah, I'm just looking to see if I have Frontinus here on my shelf. <laughs> um, yes, uh, they're, they're, uh, for the city of Rome, we are very, very lucky to have an ancient source. Uh, it's, it's generally just called De Aqueductu or something like that, about, uh, about the aqueducts in essence. Um, it's uh, Frontinus's treatise on the aqueducts. It's boring as hell, but it's just packed full of interesting information. And it's full of statistics. Okay, so you know, he'll say on the 16th milestone out of town, you will find this feature or this branch joins this aqueduct. And this, you know, this emperor uh, made these modifications to this aqueduct. Now, Frontinus is writing right before the aqua tri triana uh, was introduced. And in fact, probably Frontinus was involved in the early phases of the design planning and perhaps even construction of the aqua triana. But he only refers very vaguely to ongoing projects uh, which are probably going to be a game changer. He, he makes these little hints, uh, but he says, I, it's not, not my place to say anything more. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so Frontinus is your man. Uh, th there are a few other uh, literary references. Um, Pliny the Elder, you know, what does he not refer to in, you know, in, in the world at large? He makes some really useful uh, references to uh, the aqueducts of the city of Rome specifically and a few other aqueducts as well. Um, but otherwise, there's not a lot, uh, I have to say. We get more information from inscriptions and of course, from archeology. span Thank you. Crystal Rosenthal asks on the chat, thank you for this, I really enjoyed it. Question, if the aqueduct was originally conceived by Domitian and finished by Trajan, do you think Domitian's Domnatio Memoriae had an effect on the aqueduct? And she says, I'm thinking of Flower's article on the three stages of the Arch at Pudioli and how through the monument mo memorialization and erasure of public monuments, Domitianic and Trajanic, Pudiolians shape their collective memory and cultural identity. Yeah. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, and why on earth would you be reading that article right now? It's an inside joke, Crystal. <laughs> She's a UT art history student and she'll be taking her qualifying exams uh, later this week. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> Yes, uh, so, so, well, of course, Trajan completed many projects that Domitian began. And, um, and, and of course, the, uh, the transitional emperor between them, uh, Nerva did as well. Nerva, for example, completed Domitian's um, uh, Forum Transitorium, right? So, so 
the, I guess the, you know, one of the best ways of exercising Damnatio Memoriae, and I guess really Domitian is the first uh, emperor to, to receive Damnatio Memoriae, um, more or less officially, is, um, is simply to reclaim their projects and put your name on them. Um, I don't think that Domitian got very far with the aqueduct, okay? But he certainly got pretty far with um, this business up here in Vicarello, okay? Um, he built a bath, he built, uh, you know, um, an nymphaeum. Uh, he built a, a, a cistern, start, must have started to build the aqueduct, and then a much larger cistern replaced it. Um, is that Domitianic? Probably not. Probably it's Trajanic. Um, but um, I, I think it's, you know, it fits in perfectly with what we know about how Trajan uh, and, and Nerva dealt with Dom Domitianic monuments in the city of Rome itself. And we could say the same about the, um, about the baths of Trajan. Um, it it well, may very well be Domitian who began those. Sorry, Nick. No, I was going to I was going to ask too. Is there any reason to think that any of the course of this aqueduct between Vicarello and Rome, that Domitian started or was thinking about bringing the water? Because now you've got it there, you could just dump it in the lake too if you felt like it. Yeah. Uh, well, Domitian, of course, was was an, an immensely ambitious builder, and um, and, and the fact is, uh, his well, one of his predecessors, Nero, built a grand new bath in Rome, but not an aqueduct to, uh, to, to uh, supply it. And that probably turned out to be a bit of a problem in terms of how to, uh, to, to redistribute existing water mm. in the system. Uh, and so it may very well be that Domitian learned from that. If, if it was a mistake, Domitian may have learned from it. And, and, um, and he may have picked up on the, the fact that, uh, that his um, Lake Bracciano Villa was in a region that had a lot of water sources. How could he not pick up on it, to tell you the truth? You know, he's, a, you know, he, he's the most powerful man on earth, uh, or at least in the known world. Uh, so, so he's going to find out about these sources. He's going to find about, out about Santa Fiora uh, pretty early on. So we think that Domitian um, was the first, uh, uh, Domitian tapped Santa Fiora. We think that Domitian tapped it. Uh, and then, of course, Trajan took control of the project thereafter. Probably the Caristia source as well. Those two together, along with the Vicarello sources, would provide enough uh, water, most likely, to justify an aqueduct all the way to Rome. Um, there are other interesting feet, uh, um, historical factoids, but I, uh, th that takes us deep into the weeds, and, and we're running short on time, and I'd prefer um, to, to de deal with more questions, I think. if there are more questions. If not, I will give you a really interesting factoid. And, and that is that sometime around the end of uh, the, the later years of, of Nero's reign, <clears throat> um, the, the lake started to drain like a bathtub. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, it was the next lake over, Alciatina, that started to drain. And <clears throat> weirdly, um, this lake started to fill. Uh, it, uh, and, and ultimately, it, it rose over the course of a few decades, probably, by several meters. And it never retreated after that. In fact, it's still pretty much the same level today. Uh, <clears throat> so um, what that did was it flooded out all of the luxury properties around the periphery of the lake. And suddenly, um, real estate you know, was going for nothing. Um, people were trying to unload their properties, most likely. I mean, this is all speculation. We don't have actual documentation of it, but we have archaeological evidence to this day of, you know, villas um, stretching out into the, today's lake. Uh, so, so people's properties were, in essence, ruined, uh, and they were probably trying to dump their property on anybody who would take it. And, and because these are wealthy people, uh, you know, wealthy people still live on the lake today, of course, uh, their properties probably extended up the slopes and probably accommodated some of the spring sources as well. So what does Domitian do? Uh, he said, well, you know, golden opportunity. I can, I can buy up these people's property and start to consolidate these string, spring sources into a single aqueduct. So again, this is, um, this is all in the October article. Um, I, I will say that, it's, um, that, that Italian archaeologists in particular don't buy a lot of our um, of our hypotheses, uh, but but we do um, you know we are careful, of course, to present them as hypo as hypothetical.
Ace Higgsley asks, um, how much does a how does a Roman foot differ from an imperial system's twelve inch foot measurement? Oh, a Roman foot. And Mike and Ted O'Neill answered. Yeah, uh, yeah, Mike and Ted, uh, go for it. Ted, are you still up? 0.2957 meters. That's a that's a Roman foot. So you can do the math. Yeah, I, I can vouch for that answer. Raven is exactly correct. And as he has been throughout this lecture, very well done, Raven. Thanks, Ted. Uh, no, I, I wasn't <laughs> entirely accurate, especially in the first half, uh, because that was all your work. <laughs> Are there other questions, Bela? Is that a is that a hand raised for another question? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Back to your very first uh, photograph, which I believe was on a very plain area uh, at Rome. That's right. Yeah. Uh, there is a very sharp break in that aqueduct. Right that there. surprises yeah. me because on a flat surface, that, there doesn't seem to be any reason for a break in the line. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> it's it's hard to know. Um, it, it's hard to know what what causes uh, certain sectors of an aqueduct to collapse, but it could just be a foundation. I'm talking. Not, I'm not talking about the fracture or the collapse. Oh, oh, talking about the um, here, the the, uh, the, the uh, zig and zag, the zigzag, the zigzag, oh, the right yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. The zig zigzag. Right. Okay. So. Um, <clears throat> That may very well have to do with, um, with, with the availability of good stone foundations, but it may also have to do with existing property lines. And I suspect that it's, uh, it's much more likely to be the second. Um, aqueducts tend to follow roads, which tend to follow property lines um, for obvious reasons. Roads are public property. And uh, so if you're gonna introduce a public aque aqueduct and you don't wanna buy up every inch of the land, uh, you just run your aqueduct right beside the road. Uh, so, so most likely, it conforms to property lines, and uh, there's. And, and by the way, Frontinus tells us that every aqueduct has to have a clear, uh, a certain area of clearance on either side, which will serve as an access road. So, essentially, um, every part of an aqueduct that is reasonably accessible, whether it's above ground or below ground, is accompanied by a road. Not up in the mountains, of course, not, in, <clears throat> not even up at Vicarello, but once you get down to, uh, to the lakeside, uh, yes, there would, uh, there would have been um, a good sized road uh, paralleling the, uh, the aqueduct itself. And I have just- I was just gonna say, even those branch conduits would have, uh, would have um, uh, a clearance area associated with them. So you could at least get pack animals and carts um, up there to some extent. Yes, so that makes that that makes sense. Uh, my only remaining question about the zigzag is that uh, it's, it's a structural problem when the flow of a lot of water suddenly changes direction. Yeah, it Good it point. adds a great horizontal lateral force to the That's structure. Right. Yes, and so. it would it would create a collapse situation much more easily. So, well, yeah. so there's a lot of problems with that. Yeah, you're, uh, you're right. Uh, and yet uh, the Romans were fully aware of, uh, of this inertial force and, and they ignored it. And, and, and the way they ignored it was um, simply to ensure that um, the structures were, um, uh, were strong enough, strong enough to, to, to bear the, uh, the force. And in fact, um, Roman aqueducts regularly turn 90 degree angles. Um, and I don't mean around a curve, I mean, they go like this uh, in plan. Um, in fact, you can see a you can see a dog leg uh, right there in Rome, where um, where Nero's extension of the Aqua Claudia goes across uh, the Via San Gregorio to the Palatine Hill. Next time you're you're in Rome, have a look at that on the east side of the Palatine Hill, and you can see a little ninety degree double ninety degree dog leg uh, in the system. Um, who knows why it's there, but um, yeah, the Romans did this all the time. They weren't worried about the turbulence that, that it caused uh, and they weren't worried about the, um, uh, the horizontal thrust either. They, they simply accommodated that by, by building monumentally 
by you know making a really heavy structure that would hold it in place. Thank you. I had missed a couple of questions earlier on, and I'm sorry. Um, uh, Charles Finney asks, uh, what is the prospect of using LIDAR to map out features and especially those pathways you discussed at the end? Oh, great question. Oh, man. Uh, Ted, yeah, Ted's going to be <laughs> on top of this one, too. We are so desperate to, uh, to do aerial LIDAR in this, this region. Um, so far, um, uh, I don't know, uh, fate has, <clears throat> has not been kind to us. Um, I, it, it, yeah, the fact is a good bit of Italy has already been done at about um, uh, one meter resolution or maybe two meter resolution, which is not quite good enough for our purposes. One meter would be enough. Um, but this area has not been done. Uh, we're not entirely sure why, but um, the, um, there, are, there are a fair number of military installations in the area, for example, uh, that, that make it more challenging. But to tell you the truth, we haven't really tried yet. Um, we need to get funding first. Um, and, um, and our priorities have been elsewhere. But starting last year, really two years ago, uh, we started thinking about this very seriously. And now we've got a LIDAR specialist in the geography department at UT. Um, uh, I think we're gonna get really serious about it. Yeah, we wanna do LIDAR, we absolutely do. That would make a huge difference. It's the perfect, I mean, it is absolutely the perfect um, environment uh, for doing it. You're looking for, you know, slight changes in, um, in relief of the surface um, of the earth and you can't see it with a satellite. And Paulette Siebers asks, how much water flowed to Rome from this region? Yeah, we don't know. Um, we would really like to know. Um, if we had a goodly sector of the main conduit of the Aqua Triana uh, along a fairly typical um, gradient, then we would be able to, uh, to calculate it if we had one other factor, and that is um, the height of the water inside the conduit, which you can more or less factor in the Aqua Triana, I think, because, um, because the water leaves a very dark charcoal colored deposit. But you need all of those features. And so far, we haven't found a sector of the conduit that would allow us to do that. Um, but I will say that the Aqua Paula today delivers just a, um, uh, a small fraction of what one of the larger ancient aqueducts delivered. Um, so the Aqua Claudia delivered probably 10 times as much as the Aqua Paula, Paula does today. Am I right about that, Ted? I, I think it's more or less that. And the Aqua Paula, by the way, takes more of its water from the lake today than it does from the springs. Hmm. Now, they, uh, in antiquity, the lake was not used at all. Uh, in fact, it was Fontana who re-engineered the system and to allow some of the lake water into the aqueduct. That's why the aqueduct is not, <laughs> that's why the water of the Aqua Paula is not very drinkable today. It is, uh, it can be drunk in a, in a pinch, but um, generally you want to avoid it. And then Crystal Rosenthal asks, I'm curious if there's time, where do you go from here after COVID? What are the future plans for the project? Well, we're moving in a, and uh, yeah, Crystal, yeah, th thanks for the softball there, Crystal. She knows uh, we're moving in a more environmental direction. Um, so actually this is overdue because of COVID, but um, th there's a small lake to the north of La Lake Bracciano that we want to, to core uh, for pa uh, uh, in order to get a really good paleobotanical profile of the region. To our astonishment, we have found out that there is not much um, not much work has been done on this in central Italy. Um, uh, now, now there's a guy uh, named uh, Duncan Keenan Jones who's, who's starting to do good isotopic analysis of the um, uh, of the actual actual lime encrustation in some of the uh, aqueducts of Rome. But you don't you don't get lime from this aqueduct. This is not a limestone region, so so we don't have that option. But he's starting to do um, really interesting isotopic analysis. Um, of, for example, the Aqua Marchia and the Aqua Claudia that, that will allow uh, for, uh, for more climate uh, evidence over time. We're looking for botanical evidence over time. Uh, so, you know, that, uh, that is a completely different kind of archaeology. But ultimately, what we're interested in is trying to figure out how the history of the aqueducts of the city of Rome map onto the city's environmental history itself. 
over thousands of years. We're not just interested in the Roman imperial period. More interesting to me from that perspective than um, Trajan's time is in fact the sixth century CE when the aqueducts are cut and when Rome has to recover from that. And it rebuilds the aqueducts to some extent, but on a much smaller scale. What's going on environmentally uh, in central Italy at large uh, during this period? We'd really like to know. And we don't have any good evidence of that at all. Uh, it turns out paleobotanical evidence in this area is terrible for the last 2000 years um, because what's available above water has been plowed um, and what's available below water is mostly in volcanic lakes, which are in profile like this. <laughs> uh, so you don't, don't get good, um, you don't get good layering in lakes like that. But we found this little lake to the north, uh, which was cored back in the 1960s and produced an absolutely monumental, extremely important article published in 1970. And it's the only one that I know of uh, from the region that, that really uh, presents not just the botany, but also um, microfauna uh, of various kinds and uh, um, really, really interesting stuff. So, um, so that's the long and the short <laughs> of it, as it were. And of course, LIDAR. <laughs> By the way, we've been kicked out of the, the aqueduct itself, basically. There is now a, a law uh, throughout the land. Doesn't seem to make it to Sicily, it never does. But, um, uh, but um, unless you have Italian certification, um, uh, to, to be a speleologist, you cannot get down into any, um, any uh, human-made um, structure uh, under any circumstances. So we've essentially been, you know, our, our reconnaissance days are not entirely over, but, um, but uh, we, we need to be very careful about how we proceed. Yeah, that's not going to stop me, Raven, and I've got a nice new hat for you, so you will be all right. <laughs> <laughs> you know we've got Tamar on, on the line here too <laughs> well good so, luck yeah, that. oh sorry regarding laser scanning if anyone else got a nice laser scanner they want to lend us or um, a LiDAR machine and a plane then they'd be, be very very welcome to take an active part in the project Well, thank you so much. This has been absolutely spectacular and, um, a, and a huge pleasure. Lots of, lots of interest. Yes. My pleasure too. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Marvelous. You're welcome. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. That was great. Lots of good questions. Went really well. Yeah, yeah. It went really well. Okay, good night. Wonderful. Thanks. See you.